All right, so here's a test. Who here has a body? <laughs> yes! <laughs> you passed. And then, so how many of you see your body as a temple? Really looking at your body as a temple. A few of you, great. And then we say, do we see our body as a holy temple? And that holy temple, as you beautifully sang about, so there's a word in Judaism, and I didn't know how to pronounce it, so I'm not going to chop it up today, but there's a word in Judaism that means holy, and what it means, it's special. It's a little bit different than the rest, and so what it means is it's blessed. So if you have water and then you bless it, it's holy water, right? So if your body is a holy temple, then that means you are living in a blessing for your body all of the time. And so we can just look at that. Are we living in a place where we are blessing our body on a regular basis so that, it's, that it knows that it's something sacred, that it's holy ground in which we stand, and that the body in which we live, we are standing in holy ground? What a way to live. One of my favorite workshops that I've ever been to was uh, facilitated by someone named Andrew Harvey. Did, are, is anyone here familiar with Andrew Harvey as a spiritual teacher? A few of you? It's not too many. So, you, well, I would say look him up. He's written a lot of books, and he's extraordinary. But it's actually not his books that are, so, I mean, his books are good. He's very, very smart. So he was, I think, the youngest person to graduate from graduate school at Oxford. And he does all the stuff with religion. But it... I like his books, but they don't turn me on as much as his speaking. And I don't know if he, he's, if he speaks as much as he used to, but he used to speak a lot, and he, it just he, the room's on fire. He's just amazing, his passion, and his, just, it all just comes pouring out of him. So I did an all-day workshop with him, and it was a little unusual because it began with the darkness of the world. And so all the way up, the, for the first half of the day up until lunch, it was just how awful the things were, that were happening in this world and I thought this is the most depressing workshop I've been in my life <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what he was doing because it was just so uh, different than anything I had been in and then after lunch he started bringing the light into the midst of all that darkness and that light became more powerful than any experience that I'd had up until then which was all about light you know, most workshops are about the absolute nature of God but he took it right into the depths and it transformed so using that as a model, this month as we're going through the body, we're going to start with the, the darker side today of the body, but not to, leave, to be in a depressed state around the body, but to really deepen into the healing that we know, I know that we intuitively know, needs to happen within all of us around the body. Because we know that there's so much shaming that happens around the body. So I invite you to think about maybe the first time you experienced any sort of shame around your body, any sense of should, that it should be something other than what it was, that it should be something different. And what we find is when we feel those shoulds or that shaming, we feel like we have to apologize for what our body is because it doesn't, isn't the way it's supposed to be. And especially... And Sonia Renee Taylor points to this in her book. So many of these, these things that people share happen when we're young, when we're developing our sense of self. So our worth is so deeply intrinsic to this feeling of how we feel about our body. And we carry that on into our adulthood. I have um, my, my sister-in-law is Japanese, and so her my brother and her children and her that the children are Japanese and American, and incredible, wonderful kids, gorgeous kids. And they spent the first half of their life growing up in Japan, and then they came over to America. And what they've learned is that people do see them differently. And, and, and I look at them, I don't even, it doesn't even occur to me, but it's because it, the differences even seem slight, but they feel them. And so the, one of them just has moved as an adult, has chosen to live back in Japan because she feels more comfortable there. That's where she gets to flourish. Another one has left one city and gone to another city where there's a stronger Japanese community, Asian community. 
And these were people who were perfectly young people, com no accent, perfectly assimilated in some way to American culture, and yet there's that slight difference that makes them not normal. So when we're talking about body shaming, sometimes we think about it's only about weight. And weight's a huge one, obviously, multi-billion dollar business, but it's everything, our skin color, our gender preference, if our body likes a body that it's not supposed to like, apparently, or we feel like we're a different gender than the body we were born into, ethnicity, height, shortness. In fact, uh, I, I, one of my humbling moments was there was a gentleman that I knew who I saw fairly regularly, and he was very tall. I think he was like 6'5". And for some reason, and I knew other people were 6'5", but for some reason, every time I saw him, I commented on his height. Like, because I might, not my current family, but the, my family of origin, is, we're all pretty small. So I go, wow, you know, you're just so, I would say something about his height pretty much every time I saw him. And one day, he just got really upset. And he said, can you please stop talking about my height? Like, because to him, I was sort of calling him out as being separate, where, I, and I was completely unconscious of it. So this way of dif differentiating people who look different, too short, too tall, too, too heavy, too thin, the wrong skin color, it goes deep into our soul. And this was with men and women. That was an example. Another friend I had, when it was male, never would sh wear shorts. And I would say, why? And he goes, I have chicken legs. And I said, what do you mean of chicken legs? And he showed me his legs. They looked perfectly normal to me. But clearly, someone in his life had told him he had really skinny legs, and he would not wear shorts ever after that. So this is to say, because we know it's common, I think, a cultural understanding that women go through these. But to recognize this happens with men and women. And with women, it cuts deeply. We all know that. I had a friend in high school. She was my closest friend at my... my uh, Shaker Heights High School, and she was extraordinary, an extraordinary woman. She, she was a dancer, and I, I love dance. I'm just gonna, just, just so you know, I have good judgment. <laughs> when I watch So You Think You Could Dance, I used to the old ones. I could usually pick out in the early stages who was gonna be in the finals because I, you know, just watching. I love, I, I could see. And I say that because she was a dancer, and she invited me, to, uh, we were in high school, and she invited me to one of her performances, and I didn't want to go, because I thought, high school dancing, blah. You know, it's okay, but I really like good dancing. She was part of the uh, Math Martha Graham company in Cleveland, and so I went to go see her, and my jaw just dropped. It was extraordinary, she was extraordinary. And she choreographed this, I, I still see it, a choreographed a dance that was just amazing, child's play. I could still see it in my head. It was brilliant. She was a brilliant person, and she was my friend. How lucky was I? We would go, we would see a movie, and we would go out, and she would just talk. I mean, it was just, I remember, remember that movie, Splash? We went to see Splash. Just a, it was fun, Tom Hanks, I forgot the woman's name, blonde hair, Dear Hannah. And we just got into this really deep conversation because she was really smart. And um, so this was the person I got to hang out with and have these really cool conversations with. She got into every college that she applied to and almost all of them were Ivy League schools because she was so talented, so smart, so kind. But she also, came, but she was also, um, well, not also, like there was something wrong with it, but she had these challenges, and the challenges were, were other people's challenges with her. So as a dancer, her dad felt that her body wasn't thin enough, so he would constantly poke at her body, like, you need to stop eating so much, or, you know, you got to get that very slim, thin dancer body, and that really got to her. And then she had an aunt who uh, sent her a lot of money at one point, and it was to get a nose job. My friend was Jewish, and so she had a, you know, a bigger nose, and her aunt didn't want her to seem ethnic, I guess. And it was such a shock to my friend, because she had no problem with her nose. She thought she was perfectly beautiful. But her aunt's telling her, no, you need to change your nose, and here's the money to do it. And her parents are sort of supported it. 
So she's getting these incredible messages. Like on the one hand, she's incredibly brilliant and deep and talented and gifted. And every school acknowledged that to her. And yet she had these voices in her head of, you're not okay the way you are. It doesn't matter what your gifts are. Look at the way you're looking. It's not okay. Do we see that? It's just, it was just about her body, just about her appearances. It wasn't okay, and she was being told by the people closest to her, not strangers, the people who were closest to her, that you're not okay. That gets to you. And she went off to college, but things started to unravel for her, and I... I'm sad to say, in the early 90s, she took her life. You know, and it's, you know, these things matter. You know, it's not just, oh, I want to lose 10 pounds here, and it's like, oh, isn't this funny? You're going on a diet, blah, blah, blah. No, people are doing it all the time because it's saying I'm not worthy until I lose 10 pounds or 100 pounds or if I'm until physical shape or get the surgery that I need or the hair implants or whatever I need to make myself look normal. to fit into normal. And you know how many people don't fit into normal? Most people. <laughs> and so we, we beat ourselves up over and over and over again with this shaming process. I love that one of the things that Sonia Renee Taylor brings up is that we weren't born this way. You know, as babies, babies love their body. They're so, you, you've seen little babies when they look at their hand and like, woo, look at that. <laughs> They're so excited. They're in awe. Little kids don't think to hate their body. You know, I, if you look at yourself, when you look at any thing that you don't think you're worthy in terms of your body, the way it's not right, disabilities too, that's another one, just all sorts of ways we just beat ourselves up. If you had to wear glasses, whatever it is. But did you beat yourself up or did other people get it? Where did that shaming come? Your intrinsic nature wasn't like, oh, I hate my body. It may have probably didn't even occur to you like it didn't even occur to my friend until someone else brings it to your attention. And sometimes it's not just an individual, it's just the culture in which we live. We know that this culture has these normative standards. So you're breathing this in? because we do it to ourselves, even as adults, don't we? This isn't just when we're kids. You know, as we get older, weight still might be an issue. It's amazing when I get online with, I have three brothers, weight's always there, you know? A little, it doesn't, it's not like main topic, but it's, people constantly make comments. It's always there, but then other things, your body starts to, you can't, hold the pen the way you used to, because maybe you have arthritis, your hair starts to turn gray, you get wrinkles on your face, things, you can't do the things that you used to do. Are you compassionate with yourself? Or do you consider yourself still a holy temple then? As if you're no longer looking and feeling like a youth, like, anything that looks youthful, we praise, and anything that starts to look old, we're a little bit, we just sort of keep, like the best compliment we look is, oh, you look so young for your age. You look like you could be 20 years younger. That's the highest compliment we can get. Again, I mean, do, do we see, I mean, I've loved this. At first, when I saw body as our theme this month, I was like, I'm not sure what to do with this, but I'm loving this book. And I just like, wow, we really do think and talk about the body and look at people and their bodies all of the time. I remember being in a woman's group, and they talked about how women are constantly ranking themselves according to body weight. And it, it was a group of about 30 women, and almost every woman said, there, yep, when, I, when I'm in a room, I start assessing people, where people are in their weight. Where did that come from? Do we learn that, or do we, is that innate to us, to, to like feel like our worth, our value as human beings comes by our body weight? And I think this is so important because on the spiritual path, we tend to, you know, we talk about spiritual bypass in terms of emotions. We can spiritual bypass our bodies because it seems like, well, it seems so trivial. Well, bodies are kind of trivial. This is just a temporary world. Our bodies are just a temporary vehicle. And we're above that 
spiritually. We don't feel those things. And yet, if I talk with people much, we all feel them. And even if we don't feel it for ourselves, we make those little judgments towards other people. Constantly these micro-judgments or macro-judgments. And we have to heal it all, all of it. We have to heal all of it. So this month, we're going to be going through the four stages of consciousness. And so we're gonna, today we're going to start with the stage of conscious of to me. That's the first one. And what to me is, is that feeling that the world is happening to me. So it's a place of feeling I don't have choice and I don't have power. So they often call it victim consciousness. And I, you know, I, I'm going to say Reverend Michael teaches these four stages of consciousness, but I've heard other teachers teach it. Um, uh, Lloyd Strom and someone else. They, they, so I don't, I don't know who originated the four stages, and I always want to give credit, but I'm not sure who to give credit to. But other teachers teach this. I'm just carrying on the message. So the to me is, a lot of times the word is victim consciousness, but the problem with using something like victim consciousness is it's very, again, de negative. It's very degrading. So who's going to own and say, well, I'm feeling like a victim right now, or I'm a victim consciousness? Who wants to, I mean, well, at least in my family, the worst thing you could ever say is that you're a victim. <laughs> I don't know, you know, that just shows, so it's, if we can't heal something until we feel it, right? You've heard that. You can't heal what you don't feel. And you're not going to feel something if what, what you're feeling is making you feel like a victim, and that's like the worst thing you could be in the world. So I like the word powerless. Not that that's who we are, but just to say, for this moment, I'm feeling powerless. And the reason why I love this, that we're doing this along with the body is because just what I just said all about the body, which is we did not create that. We did not create this world that judges and, and ranks people according to their bodies and how their body is showing up and how healthy they are, how young and old they are, how, how vibrant they are and beautiful they are, and how others, I mean, I remember in my social psychology class, they said when they put a group of women that uh, it was very clear who was at the top and who was at the bottom. They said it wasn't as quite as clear with men, but with women it was very clear. Because we're very harsh about women. <laughs> That's why women feel it so much. But again, men feel it as well, and I think even more so these days. Our bodies impact our entire worth. Or not our entire worth, but a lot of our worth. And it didn't come from us. We weren't the source of that. It's sort of uh, discrimination, racism, all of it. Misogyny, all of it. It's... It's Gay Pride Month, how we are with people who are attracted to people of the same sex, people who feel like they want to be in a different body than the one they're born in. All these ways we separate and hurt ourselves. And we hurt ourselves, but we didn't grow up. We, didn't, we weren't born that way. And so that's, I really want to emphasize this point because sometimes it feels like when we say to me, well, I don't feel that way because I know I'm empowered, but these are things that surround us. All of the time, there's this cultural idea of what your body is supposed to look like in order for you to feel worthy, to feel valuable, to feel respected. Over and over, they've shown in, in research that people who are thinner get more respect and more pay than people who are heavier. Based on nothing, based on someone's initial experience, where does that come from? That's a cultural thing. We did not create that. We did not create this belief system of ourselves. So it's very important to recognize that when we feel those times of powerlessness, it's not because of something lacking in our character, because we're some weak fish. No, it's because we've been around it and surrounded by it so much of our life that we just believe it. She points to, Sonia Renee Taylor says, points to look at the times where you just even silently to yourself criticize someone for their appearance or think less of someone because of their appearance. And we can't heal what we say about other people until we heal ourselves and our own relationship with our body. And, and I want to say the to me the to me stage, feeling the world is happening to us, it's not just about the body, but the body is so clear. You know, it's the somatic memory 
And that's, I think there's so much healing that's happening in the body these days because people are recognizing you can do mental healing and emotional healing, but you also have to do physical healing because we hold so much of our emotions in our body. So we think we've healed it, and then we start connecting with our body. Oh, didn't heal that. So the place we want to get to is first acknowledging those places in ourselves with compassion. If we are judging a sense of powerlessness, if we're judging our own sense of victimhood, and, and I think victimhood, I don't like to use the word abuser, but I, I can't think of, maybe you can think of a better word, but sometimes you know they go hand in hand because I feel less than, I need to put someone else down, right? I feel better, that those two things are really intertwined. And so to begin the healing, to go into the healing, we have to acknowledge when we are shaming our own body for whatever reason, you, you know, the, it's gotten, doesn't look the way it should anymore, I'm getting older and I don't like the way it's looking, whatever. I have a disability, I'm different than anybody else, I have the wrong skin color, I'm the wrong gender, whatever. And it could be multiple things, by the way. Start noticing the invitation this week as we begin this healing process is when do we shame our own body? When do we feel powerless? And it doesn't need to be just, again, about the body. It could be powerless at my work. I can be powerless, feel powerless in my relationship. I can feel powerless to these habit patterns of thought that I have. You know, I keep attracting the same type of person. I feel powerless. You know, just acknowledge we can't heal what we don't feel acknowledge in your life when you're feeling that and just even today as you go through the day notice when you're judging other people because so often what you're judging other people is something you're feeling toward yourself so just notice there's little micro judgments that you make about the way someone looks about their appearance about the clothes that they're wearing about their socioeconomic background about their racial background about their whatever just notice don't beat yourself up because we're all in this together. We're all in this together. We all have to do this healing. I think culturally there's just a, a healing that's happening somatically that has never happened before. So we all participate. So we start to recognize with compassion. And, even at, and the reason why we notice it with other people is because then we have compassion towards ourselves. Look at your life. Look at those times when you have felt shamed from other people when you were a child, those first moments of like, oh, my, my body isn't right for whatever reason. Some way, my body isn't the way it's supposed to be to be the norm. And just notice. Notice how deeply that went into your soul. Like, now I'm not quite worthy as other people who do have the right body type, the right skin color, the right gender preference, the right hair color, whatever. Just notice the little bit of, I'm not quite as good as this person because I don't look like them, because I don't have the body of them. Again, we all have a body, and until we start opening up and recognizing, valuing all bodies as they are right now, they don't need to do anything, and we don't need to fix anything, we don't need to make anything happen. All the bodies are perfect, whole, and complete now. And so we have compassion for ourselves, for the culture and the world in which we live, that is materially oriented and we have compassion for all those places where we feel powerless we're focusing on the body this month but in any area of your life again relationships health money work i'm trying to pick all the categories looking at all those categories any place where you feel powerless allow yourself to feel it allow yourself to be humble in it and allow yourself to have compassion. And then, of course, with compassion, we need to forgive. Forgive is an active practice. It's not something that we do passively. We consciously forgive ourselves for our limited understanding. I, I think it was Yogananda who said it, but it could have been anyone who said this, which is really anytime we see the word sin, it's, it really means ignorance. And ignorance is in separation, where we feel like there's something other than the wholeness and the perfection and the beauty and the holy temple of God. Whenever we see anything that isn't a holy temple of God and we're judging something as not being a holy temple of God, any body, any group of people, we're out of alignment. 
And so we just forgive ourselves. Next week, we're going to be talking about the empowerment stage because from, from this stage, we move into empowerment. But it's really hard to get to empowerment if we haven't gone to the place of forgiveness, which makes space for the empowerment, which makes that space for that empowerment to come pouring through. So this week, I'm inviting you just to constantly be compassionate. And the compassion is key, because you won't notice it if you're beating yourself up for being judgmental. Don't, the, we're trying to avoid, <laughs> trying to heal the beating the self up thing, the shame thing, blame does not work, blaming other people, blaming ourselves. So even going back and saying, well, who was the first person who shamed me? Or it, may not, it might have been inadvertent, said things to us. We need to have compassion towards them because we're all operating under this ignorance of the separation from God. And so we have compassion and we have forgiveness. And the forgiveness is that we have forgotten who we are. The other person has forgotten who they are. And we invite the awareness to bring us back into the wholeness of who we are. That we are all already made in the image and likeness of pure spirit all of the time. Every human body, when an animal and plant body, but we'll just focus on people because it gets too complicated to bring in all of it. Every star form. <laughs> it's all made the image and likeness of God right now not when it changes not next week not a year from now when you followed your diet plan to the T and you've gotten the results that you want you are no more you or more no more God then than you are now have you ever noticed if when someone loses weight we, we get so excited and it's almost like they become a new person like, oh my gosh, you look beautiful, you're amazing, you're wonderful. And that's, it's great, but that's also saying, what were they before that? And if there's someone nearby who hasn't lost all the weight, well, does that mean they're not wonderful? We are, we are doing it reverse, you know, it's by implication. We, and again, like I was doing with that tall person, we don't even know that we're doing it sometimes. We are hurting people. So we have compassion and we forgive ourselves. So this is a week that I'm inviting you to become conscious of those comments as much as you can in your head first and foremost, and if you say them out loud, and to have compassion for yourself. Recognize the pain that's inherent behind that because, again, this isn't just about comments. It's like my friend who took her life. I mean, this is deep. This goes deep into our soul. That's why this somatic healing is just going so profoundly and deeply for people because... When you go into your body, it's, you can't bypass those deep feelings of hurt and of shame and of unworthiness. I think it's that unworthiness that just, like, I'm not worthy because of my body, my body temple. And so we, we like I said, we're all in this together, so let us have compassion. Let's notice, let's have compassion, and let's forgive. We are gently noticing, having compassion, we are forgiving, we are noticing, we are having compassion, and we are forgiving. And we create a wonderful healing environment to move into empowerment, which is next week. So thank you for doing the work. Thank you for being on this incredible journey with me. I find myself really delighted because what we know is, and I know you all know this, that when we start doing healing work of any kind, sometimes it can be uncomfortable, but you feel really good because you know it's exactly what you need to be doing. And we need to be doing this as a culture and as individuals if we want to really walk on this earth as holy temples, as you sang about so beautifully today, Suzanne. Walking on earth as holy temples. Let's pray. And how grateful I am to just enter into prayer. To acknowledge the holy of holies. That presence and that power which is blessing itself. Which is life itself. Which is beauty and harmony and health and perfection in every moment. when we allow this presence to fill our body, recognizing that every atom and cell of our body, 
every aspect of our beautiful, radiant, physical bodies is made in the image and likeness of this wholeness, of this perfection, of this beauty, of this harmony, of this health, of God itself. We have the healing that we need. We have returned home to our natural state of glory, of heaven on earth. And so I invite us all to recognize and join me in recognizing that our very beautiful body, physical, emotional, and mental, our bodies, as one, our God's bodies right now, we fully love this body in which we live. We don't need to wait for anything to happen. We love. We celebrate. And we ask for forgiveness for any places where we have been harming our body, where we have harmed our body with judgment, with blame, with negativity, for being anything less than holy. For being anything less than holy, those times where we have abused ourselves gently with little thoughts or big thoughts, with little emotions or big emotions, where we have been hurtful, where we have felt that hurt toward, from other people towards us, where we have felt like we've been separated from other people, we open our heart to that presence and that power which is greater than all of it and allow that healing to begin. We know that we've all been wandering around at times, not all the time, but at times, forgetting who and what we really are, forgetting who and what other people are. And today, we have that wonderful, soft heart of compassion and forgiveness. Right now, we allow ourselves to be forgiven. We say yes, that soft heart of forgiving heart and compassionate heart towards ourself, towards our neighbors, our family, our friends, our community, this country, this planet, which has so much diversity in it. We celebrate this diversity. We celebrate God's body in all of its millions of infinite forms. We love God's body in all of its millions and infinite forms, even as we love God's body as our form right here and right now. I am so grateful for the healing that is happening even now. We just say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for these open hearts, minds, and bodies who are absolutely willing to embrace this healing right in this moment. And we go forth open and ready for a new world. In deep and abiding gratitude for this prayer that is that is spoken and for its livingness as all of us, I just say thank you, thank you, God, and release this word. We completely let it be. Knowing as this word has been spoken, it is done. And we say together, and so it is. Amen and amen.